Hey again, everyone. This is video two on the topic of science denialism. Part one looked at the psychology of denialism and what is likely to cause it. This video will be about its features and how to recognize them. There are many tricks that people use who wish to deny scientific evidence, whether they are conscious of them or not. I'm going to go through some of them. Hopefully it will help you recognize when people use these tactics and not fall victim to them yourself. Perhaps one of the most common features of science denialism is cherry picking, also known as selection bias or anomaly hunting. If you look hard enough, you can find sources of evidence, even seemingly reputable ones, that support just about any viewpoint. This is of course not a proper application of scientific skepticism. Science is a messy process, often with many confounding variables that we aren't aware of. This often leads to results that are outside the norm, what are called outliers. Denialists who are driven by motivated reasoning will often latch onto these anomalous data and ignore or reject the data that fits the norm. A related trap is the selective use of experts or the use of fake experts to serve as justification for believing what's not accepted as the mainstream scientific view. Deniers will pick whichever subject they are passionate about and often reference groups of scientists who oppose accepted wisdom in an attempt to make it seem like there is serious debate within a field. Another main feature of denialism is the tendency to deny the scientific consensus on a particular issue, either by denying that it signifies anything important or by outright denying its existence. Examples of this include this terrible Forbes article that misrepresented a study and concluded that a majority of relevant scientists doubted the existence of man-made climate change. Or this paper, put out by an anti-GMO activist group that flat out denies the large scientific consensus that GMO foods pose no greater danger than conventionally bred crops. Hostility towards or denial of existing scientific consensus is a pretty surefire sign of someone engaging in science denialism. Next up, something you'll see quite often is the use of logical fallacies or misrepresentation in order to reject accepted science and substitute it for something else. This can be done in a variety of ways. One of the most common is what's called moving the goalposts, which is when the criteria for evaluating a claim is changed after the initial criteria have already been met in an attempt to grant the person committing this fallacy an advantage. So for example, those who question the theory of evolution often complain that there are no transitional fossils. Once the mountain of evidence of the fossil record is showed to them, they often will switch to another objection that supposedly renders evolution false. Another fallacy that is commonly used amongst deniers is what's known as the false dichotomy or false dilemma, which is when two options are presented as the only two. It's a form of the argument from ignorance fallacy. X cannot be true, therefore Y is. For example, promoters of alternative medicine will often state that it is justified to seek alternative treatment when established, scientifically proven treatments have failed. This suggests a false dichotomy that both have their place. In actuality, since alternative medicine is by definition inherently unsubstantiated, meaning there is not enough evidence to support its usage, it's not reasonable to turn towards when scientifically accepted treatments have failed or been exhausted. I will talk about this much more in my alternative medicine series. Let's cover one more fallacy that comes up often one that's come to be known as the Galileo Gambit. Here's the argument. Since Galileo was initially criticized for his ideas by the scientific establishment of the time, but later vindicated and acknowledged to be right, that therefore my alternative scientific idea that is ridiculed today will soon be widely accepted too. It's a fallacy because the fact that an idea is ridiculed does not necessarily correlate with its likelihood to be found out to be correct later. In fact, most scientific hypotheses are indeed wrong. Not to mention, it's really a position of astounding arrogance to think your untrained, 
non-expert position on a complex scientific subject is superior to the consensus in the scientific community. Another common denialist tactic is to have unreasonable demands or expectations for evidence. This usually happens because the type of evidence that the person perceives to be needed does not exist. But science is messy and we don't always have all the pieces of evidence neatly available to us. For example, those who believe in 9-11 conspiracy theories that posit government involvement in the terrorist attacks of that horrific day often reject the official story that describes the Pentagon being hit by Flight 77, one of the hijacked airplanes. They do this primarily because there is no clear video footage released that shows this. However, we do have countless other pieces of evidence that experts have examined to conclude that it had to be an airplane. The conspiracy theorists have an unreasonable demand for evidence. They will only accept their one desired piece of evidence and reject all the other pieces that point towards a similar conclusion. A related mistake is to deny entire categories of evidence and to thus demand that a particular type be fulfilled, which may not exist. For example, the randomized controlled trial is typically seen as the gold standard of all study designs, since, if done right, has the most power to weed out possible biases. However, sometimes it's not possible to do this, say for ethical reasons. When it was being discovered that smoking was a major risk factor for lung cancer, it would have been unethical to subject controlled test groups to a probable carcinogen. Therefore, other less rigorous types of studies had to be done, such as broader epidemiological studies which use data from populations of smokers in an uncontrolled manner. In this case, the data was overwhelming enough to reliably conclude that there was a link. Yet big tobacco companies used the lack of randomized controlled trials as an excuse to dismiss the causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer. More on study design in a later video series. Another common denialist tactic, one that can have powerful social and environmental consequences, is the manufacturing of doubt about a scientific finding. Big Oil spent a lot of money on campaigns to convince the public that man-made climate change wasn't real, or at least that the model was not as strong as scientists indicate. Teach the controversy, as some would say, which is a common line from creationists who wish to teach the so-called weaknesses about the theory of evolution and teach nonsensical alternatives like intelligent design. Manufacturing doubt is often done by pointing out where disagreements occur within the scientific community, by anomaly hunting, cherry picking experts who disagree, and so forth, things we've explored already here. Confronting people's denialism is a very difficult issue. Simply responding to people's flawed positions can often provoke something known as the backfire effect, which is exactly what it sounds like. This all begs the question, how should we confront denialism? Scientists seem to think the best way is to confront the tactics people are using when engaging in denialism, rather than responding to the objections themselves. This nips in the bud the fallacious or biased or dishonest tactics. Many of these features of denialism can be avoided if we respect the scientific consensus, as discussed in previous episodes, and take as broad a view of the literature as possible. It is also a good idea to be familiar with the many cognitive biases humans fall victim to when assessing reality, as well as a good understanding of logical fallacies. I want to cover one more feature of denialism here before we close off, and it will segue nicely into the next video series. One of the most common denialist tactics is the tendency to posit conspiracy theories as a means to reject established science and propose an alternative explanation. Pretty much every major denialist movement today has a conspiracy theory at its core. The anti-vaccination movement claims that Big Pharma is suppressing research about the side effects of vaccines and distorts the science to claim that vaccines are effective. The anti-GMO movement claims that Monsanto and other biotech companies control the peer-reviewed literature to the extent that they have corrupted the evidence to side with their profit motives. And the 9-11 Truth Movement claims that the government had a role in the terrorist events of 
while they suppress any independent investigation into what really happened that day. In all cases, the proposed conspiracies are of a magnitude so great that their plausibility is extremely low due to the number of moving parts required to pull off such a so-called grand conspiracy. Conspiracy theories and the psychology of conspiracy thinking, particularly grand conspiracy thinking, is the next topic. Follow me to the next video series for that. Thanks for watching.